All right, it's noon. Thanks everybody for joining. We're gonna give just one more minute for folks to gather. All right, why don't we go ahead and, and get started. Thank you all uh, for being with us today. Uh, my name is Adam Murray. I'm the CEO of Inner City Law Center. Uh, it's great to have you with us today. We have a fabulous uh, panel today for our next on the ground session. Uh, we have three uh, marvelous Inner City Law Center staff members with us today who you're gonna hear from about our work with homeless veterans. Uh, so very excited uh, that you can join us for that. Two housekeeping things before I uh, quickly share who they are and we just jump right into it. The first is that there's a chat button uh, and you're probably very familiar with that by now, uh, but there's a chat button on the bottom of the screen that you are welcome to comment and, and share your thoughts about anything you're hearing, about your experience, uh, if you're a veteran and dealt with some of these issues, if you've been a pro bono attorney and dealt with some of these issues, uh, you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts as we're going through the presentation. Uh, and secondly, there's also a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and so if you have a question that you would like to hear the panelists address, please post it there uh, and we will save some time at the end of the presentation to uh, address some of those. So uh, thank you again for being with us today. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, legal services attorney Mary Boyd, who's with us from our Homeless Veterans Project, uh, as well as supervising attorney John Killerin and directing attorney uh, Kara Mahoney. So it's great to have all three of you today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing these fabulous folks, uh, although Vanessa is going to throw, Vanessa and Abby are supporting us uh, behind the scenes, uh, and Vanessa is going to throw uh, some um, uh, uh, links in the, in the chat uh, so folks can see the bios of the folks you're listening from. But I think you will see uh, how incredibly thoughtful and um, uh, powerful these folks are as we go through the presentation today. So maybe we can start off, uh, if one of you could kick us off by talking a little bit about, you know, why does Inner City Law Center have a homeless veterans project? I can do that, Adam. Um, so there are thousands of military veterans who are living on the street or have no fixed place to call home every night. Um, in Los Angeles specifically, as of January 2020, there were 3,902 veterans experiencing homelessness on any given night, and that is 10% uh, of total veterans who are experiencing homelessness in the nation. 
Now, many veterans experiencing homelessness are eligible for VA benefits such as healthcare and monthly income that would enable them to afford a home of their own. And legal services can really pay, play a big part in that. Um, we focus our legal representation on obtaining income and obtaining lifetime monthly benefits so that veterans can become housed and also so that they can stay housed. We have been representing veterans experiencing homelessness since 1998, um, and we have developed expertise with um, veterans particularly struggling with post-traumatic stress, with traumatic brain injury, uh, veterans who are survivors of sexual violence in the military. And we also have expertise in representing veterans who have less than honorable discharge statuses and have been told by the VA that they are not veterans and they're not entitled to veterans benefits. So to give a, a sense of our work, let me tell you about one of the clients that we represented. Um, I will call him Corey. Corey joined the army straight out of high school, which was right after 9-11. So eventually he was deployed to Iraq. Um, and while he was there, he went through a number of traumatizing experiences that go along with being in a war zone. He finished his tour and after he got back stateside, he started experiencing uncontrollable rage, survivor's guilt, uh, intrusive memories, and he felt really no motivation to do his duties. And he recognized in himself, he was not, he was not feeling like himself. So he sought help and in doing so, the army actually diagnosed him with personality disorder and discharged him. So Corey became a civilian again, and he had serious difficulty readjusting to that. He was sleeping for two hours a night. He couldn't hold a job. He isolated himself. He started hearing voices um, and also seeing shadows during the day. He started living in his car because he couldn't afford housing. Um, and we met him at a shelter in Hollywood for veterans and we opened a case for him. Um, I requested Corey records and when I got them, there was no mention of any of the things that Corey had experienced when he was deployed. And he also didn't have a combat award. So we had to gather evidence to demonstrate to the VA what Corey had been through. And not only that, we also had to demonstrate that he did not have personality disorder. He had post-traumatic stress disorder, and he also had comorbid psychosis that was causing him to see things and hear things that weren't actually there. Um, and the reason for that is because if he had personality disorder, the VA would not pay him benefits. So we tracked down his unit history. We got buddy statements from people he served with. We got a declaration from Corey. We put all this evidence together and we were right about to submit. And then Corey uh, fell out of contact. Um, we called, we emailed, we called hospitals, um, we called jails and prisons, and we could not find him. So a few months went by and we reluctantly closed his case. Um, Fortunately, a few weeks later, Corey, out of the blue, got back in touch and he said, you know, he'd been going through a lot, um, but he was ready to focus on his VA case now. So we happily reopened his case and we filed. And then we received uh, a bunch of denials from the VA. Uh, one decision said that the VA could not find evidence that Corey had been in the IED blast that he said he'd been in. And in another decision, the VA said that he only experienced mild mental health symptoms. So we had to appeal multiple times. Um, and it, it took a while, but after two years um, from the time that we first filed his case and after a lot of persistence, um, Corey was found 100% service connected. He got over $65,000 in back pay and he will receive over $3,100 a month for the rest of his life. So that is one example of the type of case we work on and the results that we can achieve. So thanks for that, Karen. Especially thank you for sharing the case. I find that you know hearing about our clients' situations and, and the specifics of it is often the best way to, to learn about what we really do. I'm wondering, uh, John or Mary, if one of you maybe you know at the outset of this call can share another case that uh, you know might sort of set the tone as we move forward with our conversation. Yeah, Adam, I can uh, I can jump in on that. So I have a client. Um, I'm going to call her Anne, and she served for six years. She was honorably discharged but she had a incorrect assumption that I find a lot of our clients have that she wasn't actually a veteran and she didn't qualify for veterans benefits under a misconception that, you know, despite her six years of honorable service, she, she didn't qualify. Um, and also because during her service, she experienced sexual violence and as a result developed a mental health disability. And her thought was that 
the VA only covers disabilities related to, you know, physical injuries and not those invisible wounds. So the first thing that I did was, you know, confirm and tell her that she is in fact a veteran, that she's eligible for all the myriad of benefits that a person who served this country, you know, is eligible for. And then also, you know, we began to request the records and get started on getting her the help that she needs um, because of these invisible wounds that she suffered in service. That's great. That that story raises a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of uh, issues. And maybe we can spend a little bit of time talking about maybe starting with the question of who is a veteran and who the VA considers a veteran. Can one of you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, Adam, I'd be happy to. Um, and I think um, it's helpful here to jump in first with who ICLC considers a veteran. Um, on the Veterans Project at Inner City, we will work with anyone who served for at least one day in the military, regardless of their discharge status or their length in service, uh, the length of time in service. We take this broad definition because of how important veteran status is for the clients that we work with. Um, as Mary and Kara have already alluded to, if you're considered a veteran in the eyes of the VA, that entitles you to a whole host of benefits, anything from VA healthcare eligibility to VA home loans. And for our clients, oftentimes most importantly to these disability benefits connected to their time in service. Um, but as Mary mentioned, there's several folks who don't consider themselves veterans, and that could be for a variety of reasons. Like Mary mentioned, um, some folks think that in order to be a veteran, you need to have served for 20 years and retired from the military. Um, others might think that you need to have engaged in combat or have become injured in service. Um, and for certain groups of veterans, especially women veterans and veterans of color, the VA hasn't always been a very welcoming place for them to go. Um, and so there was a distrust of the military, a distrust of the VA, and a very reasonable instinct to not identify as a veteran or to not seek health care at the VA. Um, there's a, probably a wide variety of other reasons that folks might not consider themselves veterans. Um, but the one that we deal with the most is, like Kara mentioned earlier, veterans who have less than honorable discharges. So John, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I know that's something that we we focus on a lot and end up doing a lot of work on. Can you talk about the importance of, of discharge status? Why, what is it? Why does it matter? Absolutely. Yeah, I can give uh, a brief overview of, of all the different types of discharge statuses there are and the reasons for it. I could certainly talk about this for a lot longer. Um, but long story short, veterans, um, anyone that served in the military, once they leave, they're given a discharge status. That could be anything from a fully honorable discharge to a dishonorable discharge, say by reason of a general court-martial conviction. However, um, there's a wide variety of discharges kind of in between those two, but I think what's most important to know is that for any veteran that receives a discharge that's less than honorable, they're at risk of losing some of the benefits that I talked about earlier. Um, of those kind of less than honorable discharge statuses, the one that we deal with the most is what's called an other than honorable discharge, which a lot of veterans will consider or call um, colloquially, I guess, if you will, a bad paper discharge. This discharge is an issue um, for veterans because it means that they are at real risk of not being considered a veteran in the eyes of the VA and, and not having access to any of the benefits that we talked about earlier. Um, there's a wide variety of reasons that a veteran might get an OTH discharge, but I think it's important here to realize that at least for the vast majority of the veterans that we work with that have an OTH, it's not because they were a bad Marine, a bad soldier, a bad sailor. More often than not, they have this discharge status because they endured a trauma in service or they are dealing with undiagnosed mental health issues that they're trying to deal with on their own, um, oftentimes through self-medication. And as a result, the misconduct leading to their discharge is really their attempt to cope with what they dealt with in service. And so yeah, how, do, how do we help with that, John? What's what's our role in, at Inner City Law Center in, in assisting in those situations? Absolutely. Um, I think I think it's really some of the most important work that we do on the veterans team. We can come in and help veterans change and upgrade that discharge. And um, I think maybe the best way that I can illustrate kind of how we do that is to tell a story of a client I worked with. Um, so I'll share Jacob's story here. Jacob is a gay Navy veteran who served during the don't ask, don't tell era in the military. So this meant that he needed to hide his sexuality 
or else he could receive a bad paper discharge just for being gay. And despite this overwhelming pressure, Jacob initially handled it well. He scored well on his evaluation reports and served without incident for almost two years until he was attacked and sexually assaulted by a fellow sailor who he considered to be a friend. When he, when he reported that incident to his superior, he was shocked and horrified that they seemed more concerned with figuring out whether or not Jacob was gay than they were about punishing his assaulter or helping Jacob recover from this trauma. And it was at that point that Jacob describes life on his ship as a living hell. He felt like he couldn't trust anyone and had no idea when he would be assaulted next. So when the ship docked, he, you know, not surprisingly would get as far away from his fellow sailors as he could, usually drinking alone until he blacked out and then returning for duty hours or even days late. And it was at this point that Jacob was discharged with that OTH for the, from the Navy for what the Navy described as a pattern of misconduct. For years after that, Jacob had no idea that his discharge status could be challenged or changed, but the good news is that it can. And then that's exactly where um, we come in. It's cases like Jacob's where a homeless veterans project at ICLC can really do its work. Um, we represent veterans before the VA in what are called character of discharge determinations. The VA in these determinations considers whether a veteran with an OTH discharge will be found honorable for VA purposes. In other words, whether they will be a veteran in the eyes of the VA. We also represent veterans before the Department of Defense at discharge review panels, where we argue that factors such as the traumatic events a veteran endured in service mitigate their misconduct. In Jacob's case, we compiled evidence from his service records, from his treating mental health providers, and Jacob's own statement about what happened in service and what he's dealt with since. Then we argued at a character of discharge hearing before the VA that his misconduct wasn't willful, but instead the direct result of the assault he endured. And we won Jacob's case. Because the VA finally found him honorable for VA purposes, Jacob also now receives VA health care and disability compensation benefits for PTSD. For Jacob, these benefits provide the stability he lacked for years. They're allowing him to pay for an apartment and his basic necessities while he goes back to school. So that's great. I, I want to pull us back, if we can, to something that was in Mary's story, another thing that was in Mary's story earlier, which is the question of what counts as a disability, you know, what, what, we, what, what you have to establish with respect to the VA in that respect. Can one of you speak a little bit about, about that? Yes, I can speak to that. Um, so it's common for veterans like uh, Mary's client Anne to think that their disability needs to have been caused by service, but that's not actually the case. Um, when people sign up for the military, the military agrees to take care of them if they incur any disabilities in service. There's no workers' compensation, um, and service members can't sue the military for any harm that they experience in service. So that's where B VA benefits step in to fill the gap. Um, I think a, a helpful way for me to kind of explain this is to talk about another client story. Um, so we had a case where we represented a client with a pretty uncommon disability, uh, narcolepsy. So our client, who I will call Malia, grew up in the foster care system. And when she turned 18, she enlisted in the army. Um, and then out of nowhere, a few weeks into her service, she started falling asleep on duty and having problems with memory and with um, concentration. And so she was not sure what was going on with her. Um, she thought maybe she was experiencing depression. So she decided to go and get uh, checked out. So when she was being examining, examined by an army doctor, she admitted that in high school, she'd fallen asleep on occasion during classes as, as a lot of teenagers do. Um, but unfortunately that statement was used against her. The army doctor used that to say that she had pre-existing narcolepsy. Um, and that's really important because if, if the VA determined that she had pre-existing narcolepsy as well, that would mean that they would not have to pay her any benefits. So um, Malia was adamant that she had never experienced anything like what she started experiencing in service, which was um, what she described sleep attacks, severe fatigue, and day terrors. She would fall asleep everywhere um, while standing in the middle of a conversation while she was eating. She was not able to drive because of the danger. She experienced being robbed five times while asleep in public. 
Um, and she's missed job interviews because she's fallen asleep on public transportation. So I met Malia after she was discharged um, at a shelter for women veterans. And during our fight to obtain VA benefits for her, we kept receiving decisions saying that, well, the military couldn't have caused her narcolepsy um, or that she had pre-existing narcolepsy, just as the army doctor said. But fortunately, the law is very strong um, and it's in favor of veterans that the military does not have to cause your disability. Um, and also that there has to be unmistakable evidence that a disability existed prior to service before the VA can say it was pre-existing and they refused to pay you benefits. So we were able to use Malia's foster care records and they were pretty extensive and showed no narcolepsy diagnosis prior to service. We also obtained statements from high school friends who testified to the same. And we also used, you know, most importantly, Malia's own declaration about her symptoms and when they onset and the real day-to-day -day challenges that she experiences because because of a disability that started during service. So it took us three years, but Malia ended up getting 100% service connected. She got about $100,000 in retroactive benefits, and she will also receive over $3,100 for the rest of her life um, every month. Um, so Going back to Mary's client, Anne, you know, it's, it's also common for people like um, Anne to think that their disability has to be physical and otherwise it won't count for VA benefits, but that is not the case. And not only that, mental health disabilities don't have to have been precipitated by a clear traumatic event like a combat um, experience or a sexual assault. So one I think way of explaining this is um, using a diagnosis like schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, if it's going to manifest, you know, typically manifests in people when they are in their late teens or early 20s. And that's precisely when a lot of people who serve are, are in the military. And people who experience a diagnosis like schizophrenia, if those symptoms start in the military, they're just deserving of VA benefits as, as anyone else, um, as someone whose disability was caused by the military. And the VA often gets this wrong, um, and veterans often don't even know this. Um, so we have to appeal these cases often more than once. So um, I have another question for you guys. Before I get to that, let me just uh, welcome folks who have joined us later in the program and point out that we have a chat function that we would love to have comments in if things strike you or uh, occur to you as you're listening to folks. And there's a Q&A button on the bottom as well. If people want to uh, put in a question, we'll come to questions uh, later in the program. But let me, if I can, ask a slightly different angle on this. So, you know, we've been talking about um, sort of why lawyers are important in these issues, right? You have to establish your discharge status. You have to establish that the disability meets the, the criteria. You have to establish whether or not someone's a veteran. But very often, uh, and we do a lot of that, obviously, from, from, from the stories you guys are telling, but often I think um, we also have to work, or, or you all have to work as case managers and social workers uh, and do you know, a much more holistic sort of practice and role than just being the sort of traditional lawyer uh, on these cases. Um, you know, part of that's because we have clients who are struggling often with serious mental health issues, they're living on the streets and struggling with everything that comes from that. Um, but can one of you speak a little bit about sort of that aspect of the practice uh, and the challenges involved with that and some of what your work looks like from, from that angle, a little bit less the legal angle and a little bit more sort of the client interaction, client service side? Uh, yeah, sure. I can talk about that. So typically our clients are dealing with a large amount of challenges between, you know, being homeless and all of that entails. And also, you know, they might have other legal issues. So rarely do our clients actually come to us with, you know, one neat issue that we can just quickly resolve. Uh, so that's why we partner with different organizations. We partner with doctors at the VA in our medical legal partnerships in order to provide those clients with all the care that they need. Um, so and oftentimes our clients will exhibit what's called challenging behaviors. Um, and that's because, you know, a lot of times they are experiencing mental health issues. They are, you know, undergoing the strain and the trauma of being homeless. And a lot of times they have isolated themselves from any other safety net. So we come in a lot of times as their safety net, not just as their attorney, but we can also serve as a link for these clients, um, 
as case managers, you know, a lot of the times our clients don't have access to the internet or they don't have access to phones. Uh, they don't have a, a set mailing address. So we provide a mailing address for them. You know, we make sure that when we may do intakes, we find out where they're generally located at so that if something comes up, we can go out and find them. So we do a lot more work than just the legal issue of it, but you know, we're that a lot of times that person that our clients can depend on. We are the stabilizing force in our clients' lives. And I think, you know, getting them the benefits helps them on their way. But I think the relationship that we have with our clients is something that is is different and is what really helps our clients in the long run. Mary, you mentioned that. Oh, sorry, go ahead, John. I was I was just gonna jump in there. I, I think. What, what Mary said is very true. We often wear a lot of different hats when it comes to doing this work. But I, I think it's also important to realize like how important as a result our connections with our community partners, or as Mary mentioned, our medical legal partnerships are. Because I mean, we're, we can be the experts or we try to be the experts in kind of this one area, you know, when it comes to the legal issues that they face. But it really can make all the difference in the world if we know or have a relationship with the client psychologist at the VA or, you know, say with their SSVF case manager. So if they're having a problem with their landlord, um, obviously there's a legal issue there that we can help with, but it's helpful to know the case manager that's on the ground. Or if they're having a mental health issue, we can help them get disability benefits for it. But if we have a direct line and the confidentiality waivers in place with their psychologist, that's that's huge. So we don't have to be the expert in all of that other stuff. So my follow-up question, Mary, was going to be a little bit along those lines of what of what John mentioned. So uh, you both mentioned, you know, we have obviously strong partnerships with the the mental health professionals and the health professionals at the VA, but you also both alluded to strong partnerships with other sort of community-based nonprofit organizations. And I just wonder, you know, for our audience, if we can give a shout out to a couple of those, you know, that you find particularly be great partners. Um, so, um, you know, and I know there's a long list. So, you know, if there's somebody on the phone who we're not mentioning, uh, no offense, Matt, but, you know, are there folks who jump out at you that you, know, you really regularly work with? I think people are often wondering, you know, sort of who are good groups in this, in this area. And I know we work with a lot. So I don't know if anybody jumps out at you as somebody, you know, you have really great experiences with their case managers and, uh, and others, if there's anybody in particular. Kara, do you want to jump in there? Sure. So we, um, I'd say one of our, our longest standing partnerships is with a department of mental health. Um, and especially, you know, there's um, a somewhat new program called the Veteran Peer Access Network, and they serve a lot of veterans who've been turned away by VA and told they're not a veteran. Um, and they provide them with the care that they're entitled to. Um, and they refer veterans to us um, so that we can get them VA eligible, so that the VA will provide them with the benefits that they that they should have. Um, but but you're right, Adam, there's so many great partners. Um, we also work very closely with um, the CBEST program through the Department of Health Services. Um, we have a lot of great SS SVF partners um, work very closely with PATH in particular um, and have some new relationship with, relationships with Skid Row-based um, organizations um, like Downtown Women's Center. Um, and that's you know, a particular focus for us because we are also located on Skid Row and we really want to serve the community um, that we're a part of. Appreciate that. And apologies if people were on the phone and, and we left you out. Uh, it, is a, it, is, it is an amazing community of folks that sort of pull together. Uh, and so I just wanted to give a shout out to a few of them. Um, so, so maybe can one of you talk a little bit, and I know it comes through to some degree in the stories you've told already, but talk about um, sort of on the more, I think of as more optimistic side uh, of, of this work, right? A lot of what we've been talking about, you've been talking about is the struggles, right? And what our, what our clients are having to overcome and the pathway for getting through that. But at the end of the day, we, we really do achieve pretty amazing results for our clients and in partnership with our clients. And um, so can you talk a little bit about you know, what that looks like? I can do that. Yeah, so right now um, we have cases open on behalf of about 300 veterans who are experiencing homelessness. And at the time that we meet our clients, most of them have previously sought to access VA benefits and they've been denied. So we help them appeal the denial of benefits and we also help them to obtain the highest monthly compensation possible. Um, the results that we get can be really stabilizing and in, in many cases, life-changing. Um, 
So nationally, veterans who are not represented win about 30% of their VA benefits appeals. And at Inner City Law Center last year, we won 92% of our VA benefits cases and 91% of our character of discharge and discharge upgrade cases. Um, and we also don't just win cases, we get really big results, meaning that our clients get the highest compensation rates possible from VA. The average compensation that we win for our clients is 70% higher than national and state averages. Um, so what that looks like in, in terms of numbers is over the past four years, we have recovered over nine and a half million dollars in retroactive benefits uh, and $7.9 million in increased annual income for veterans experiencing homelessness. And um, one other thing to keep in mind is that when veterans become eligible for VA benefits or when they become service connected, they also get increased access to VA healthcare and they also get other benefits such as um, VA permanent supportive housing vouchers, VASH, um, job training, burial benefits, home loans, et cetera. Um, so there's a host of benefits that our clients now have access to as a result of our representation. Great. So I hope I hate to pull us back to the more pessimistic uh, piece, Kara, because that's all incredible. I think in terms of what we're able to achieve. But how long are these cases running? What's what's the timeline for this work? Yeah, um, it, it takes an outrageously long amount of time to resolve a VA case, and that's for a variety of reasons. And I'll talk about two of them. Um, one is the delay in obtaining records. Um, in order from the time that we request records to when we get them, it can take months or even a, a little bit over a year to actually get those. And then the other reason is we regularly receive legally deficient decisions that require us to file multiple appeals, as I've said. As I've said. Um, so on average, our cases take a little over two years to resolve from the time that we first meet the client until when we close their case. But sometimes we have cases that can resolve a little bit more quickly than that. Um, and, and we also have other cases that have been open for four or more years. Um, the reality, as Mary was talking about earlier, is that the vast majority of veterans that we represent are experiencing more than one legal issue. We do our best to help them resolve each one of those, um, which can really take time, but it's why developing trusting relationships with clients is really crucial to the long-term lifetime benefits um, and successes that we can achieve with our clients. And then to speak to one other piece that Mary mentioned earlier is, you know, we we guide clients through the whole process and, and fight alongside them in, in advocating for themselves. But we also very much see ourselves as a buffer or a barrier to our clients with a, a large government agency like the VA because by the time our clients get to us, they're often really exhausted from dealing with the process. The VA can make it really, really hard for veterans to obtain the benefits that they're entitled to. So our, our clients can be you know, filing on their own and they'll submit a form and then the VA will say, well, that's not the right form. Um, or they will submit a, a stressor statement in support of a claim for PTSD. And the VA will respond and say, you need to su submit a stressor statement in support of your claim for PTSD. So the veteran is left drained and exhausted. Um, so our clients also, you know, not only that, they also have other things they're, they're dealing with, housing instability, food insecurity, um, medical appointments. And so when, when we're on a case, we really see it as our job to deal with those, you know, red tape hurdles and relieve them of that burden of having to deal with bureaucracy and then just get them the benefits that they deserve. Yeah, I think... Um... You, you know, you talk about the two-year average, Kara, and it's it's a long time, but I think kind of like what you just said, there's a lot of hurdles, but as a result, kind of a lot of small victories along the way. Um, and so while an entire case might take two years, oftentimes those two years are punctuated by um, small or sometimes large successes along the way. You know, we might have a client that comes to us and the, the thing that they need help with initially is an outstanding citation that's preventing them from getting their driver's license back. So it's like, we can help with that and that might take a couple of months. And then we've got a veteran that has an OTH discharge and we might not be successful on all components of their VA case right away, but we might get them VA eligible first, you know, and that might take 
six or nine months, and then we can refocus our appeal on, you know, getting them those service connected disability benefits, or they get service connected, but only for some things or only at a small amount, and we can kind of appeal that decision to get them that full amount that you were talking about. So, so the cases are long, but there's so much that goes into each one that it is nice to kind of be able to celebrate um, successes along the way with our clients. So that's, I appreciate the optimistic, the optimism, John, and that, um, you know, looking at it from the other side, just to highlight, that's two years after we get involved and Correct. appeal, right? So there's a whole, and this goes to why the veterans are so frustrated when they show up uh, with us, right? But there's often been years before that where they've tried to, to absolutely. So it's just an incredibly frustrating process. Um, I'm, I'm getting a few uh, questions on my text as well from folks who are not not using the Q&A button below. Um, so um, I just want to inject, I know we're still so walking through this and haven't gotten to the Q&A, but I do want one question in particular that got texted to me that I just want to ask you guys about, which is, um, I, you know, how has this work changed with COVID? How is it different than it was pre-COVID? Can one of you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I can, I can take that question. So uh, COVID has presented its own set of challenges over the last 20 months. Um, we've really had to get creative uh, because most of our clients have, you know, severe trust issues because like John and Kara were saying, you know, they've kind of been beaten down by the system. And so it is imperative that when we're working with these clients that we build trust and that we build that rapport. And this is just you know, made harder by not being able to be in the office, by not being able to meet with the clients directly. Our offices are located on Skid Row, and we did that for a reason so that we would be easily accessible to these clients. And then with these COVID restrictions, you know, we're not able to do that. And then in addition, there are issues with getting clients access to the VA because these VA employees are also working from home. And so we have to make up alternatives for getting these clients hearings scheduled virtually via phone, getting documents submitted electronically. And so, you know, we've definitely had to change up some of our systems and put in more work so that these clients are able to, you know, get the benefits because it is a long process and we don't want COVID to slow that process any more than it's going to be. Thanks for that, Mary. I, you know, a question that I often get when I'm out talking about this issue relates to the Westwood VA campus. Uh, and I know you've already, you've already alluded to a medical legal partnership. Uh, one of, we have two of those and one of them's there at the campus with the, with the mental health emergency folks there. But um, you know, uh, we, we inner city law center sued a number of years ago to try to force some additional housing on that campus. Can one of you just give our audience a bit of an update on sort of you know, what progress we are or not having uh, with respect to having additional housing on that campus? Sure, I, I can talk. I can talk briefly about that. So in 2015, um, the plaintiffs in that lawsuit, the, the veterans that sued for um, permanent housing on the campus, uh, reached a settlement that would um, have the VA create 1,200 units of permanent supportive housing on the West LA VA campus. So that was um, a little over six years ago now. Unfortunately, the number of actual housing units, permanent housing units on the campus is far less than that. In fact, there are 54 currently permanent supportive housing units on the campus. Um, it's our understanding that there are some infrastructure challenges to, to building out some of that permanent supportive housing, um, but it's our feeling that there's quite a bit of bureaucratic red tape that's slowing up the process. Um, and it's not a situation um, where the need isn't, isn't there. The need is absolutely there. In fact, um, up until recently, there's a community of veterans living um, uh, right outside the campus in uh, uh, homeless veterans living in tents in a community outside the campus um, who were not receiving services or at the very least weren't receiving permanent housing there. Um, unfortunately, um, LA County Sheriff evicted the veterans from that community a couple of weeks ago, such that they're not there um, in the same way that they were. Now, the good news is that some of those veterans have received temporary housing, both within, inside the VA campus, as well as out. Um, but um, the reality is they're not in permanent housing. And, and right now, there's not nearly enough permanent housing, permanent supportive housing on that campus. Um, and the frustrating thing is, I, I think there could be. Um, certainly, the land is there. I think it's over 180 acres uh, in, in Westwood that the campus entails. 
Um, and the federal resources certainly should be there to build that housing so that we can actually see uh, supportive, permanent supportive housing community um, in Westwood on that VA campus. Thank you, John. Um, I wanna go to, to our questions uh, that people posted um, in a moment, but before I, I do that, um, can one of you speak a little bit, um, just so we make sure we, we get to it, uh, about how people can help? What, what you know, folks who are listening in want to be supportive of, of these issues and 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 supportive of the vets who are on our streets. What does that look like? What sorts of things can they do to be of assistance? We can talk about that. So I think staying informed is a really good way. Attending today is great. Um, and please sign up for Inner City Law Center's newsletter and follow us on social media. Um, donate to Inner City Law Center and other organizations that focus on serving veterans experiencing homelessness. Um, join us as a pro bono partner. Uh, so this morning we had an MCLE training for attorneys and a recording of that's going to be available. We do multiple of those types of trainings a year and getting involved as a pro bono partner is a really great way to support the work. Um, and, and finally, uh, support affordable housing in your neighborhood. We will not solve homelessness in Los Angeles unless we have affordable housing in every single neighborhood here. Great, thanks for that. So, um, so let me move to a few of our questions and I'll, I'll throw these out and just as we've been doing, you guys can, can jump in uh, individually or collectively however, however you wanna do it. But let me start with uh, a question about, does ICLC build relationships with specific departments within the VA to help streamline and speed up the process in claim resolution? I can, I can, take, a, I can take a stab at that one and then anyone else feel free to kind of fill in. Um, I mean, the answer, the answer is yes, um, but with some limitations. So the VA claims process starts at um, what are called VA regional offices. So there is one in LA. It's in fact in the federal building um, right across the street from the Westwood campus. And because we do a lot of our appeals work at the initial levels, the reason why we do that is because that's the quickest way ideally to get veterans the benefits that they're entitled to. We have developed relationships with their claims team um, at, the, at the LA regional office. Um, which and, and those relationships can be extremely helpful in kind of um, you know helping put faces uh, to 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 this system and, and, and being able to to really work with people in individual cases. Um, uh, a lot of the higher level appeals and even some of the lower ones are actually handled nationally. Um, so it's a little harder to develop you know really robust relationships with the people on the VA side of things that are doing that work. Um, you know that being said, you know, we do our best to attend a lot of the national conferences or national webinars that, you know, VA folks are putting out. We've got a really good relationship with the Office of General Counsel um, and have provided them a lot of guidance and support on establishing medical legal partnerships um, with VAs across the nation. Um, and we've also worked with other VA regional offices on higher level review appeals and, you know, making sure that we're where we can kind of getting to know the people that are um, I guess, administering best practices on the VA end of things. So if we see a case where, um, you know, there's something particularly, you know, a particularly egregious error, or, or perhaps we're dealing with a veteran who has a really chronic illness or a situation where, you know, waiting, let me put it this way, waiting is untenable for any of our clients, but obviously there are situations that can become more dire. So if, if we see uh, an incredibly emergent situation like that, it helps to have the national connections that we do have to, to get those cases um, either corrected or, or decided um, on the emergent level that they deserve. Right, thank you. Um, another question for you. Uh, you've talked about the fact that veterans with less than honorable discharge statuses are not eligible for many VA benefits and therefore are more likely to experience homelessness. Uh, that's obviously what we see. Um, uh, has there been any recognition of this by the government? Otherwise, is there anything being done sort of at a more structural level to address those sorts of issues? Um, a bit. So one thing I can say is that as of this year, Congress did expand eligibility for HUD VASH vouchers. So now veterans who are experiencing homelessness who do have less than honorable discharge statuses can obtain VASH vouchers, uh, where previously they were ineligible. Um, and these vouchers are permanent rent subsidies combined with health care and case management services. Um, so the expansion is, is, a, is a good step forward towards ending veteran homelessness. Um, 
Um, and so that's that's kind of one piece that we have seen move in a positive direction. And is that rolled out already? There are some implementation problems is what we are hearing. Um, so it seems like the you know various locations throughout the country trying to expand this eligibility are, are running into, on, into issues on it. Gotcha. Um, let me pull up here, go back to my questions here for a second. So um, there's another question, I'll, I'll read the exact question, but I'll, I'll maybe make it more general as well. Is there an outreach program at ICLC or do veterans have to contact ICLC first? This is a question we often get about sort of how do people connect with our services? And it sounds like in particular here that you know, the, the question is how much sort of affirmative outreach is there to connect with the veterans we most wanna serve? But can one of you talk a little bit about sort of how cases get to us and either what we do or our partners do in terms of that outreach? Yeah, I can do that. So we have a number of partnerships with organizations throughout LA County that do have outreach components. Um, and that is how we get the majority of our clients. Those, those organizations will then refer those veterans they've identified um, and screened for what services they need assistance with and send them to us if there's a VA benefits or other legal need that we can help with. Um, so we work very closely with the county CBIS program, as I mentioned earlier, and the Veteran Peer Access Network. Um, so connecting with one of those programs, if, if uh, you wanted to connect with us, is going to be the best way to get routed to the Homeless Veterans Project at Inner City Law Center. Um, and the other thing is, um, we have we have other community partnerships um, with PATH SSVF. We have two medical legal partnerships, one at the West Los Angeles VA um, and one at the Long Beach Women's Mental Health Center. So those are other ways to get connected. Um, and then finally, we, we also are sometimes able to take on cases from other sources um, or take on cold calls. And we prioritize representing veterans who are experiencing homelessness uh, or veterans of color and are living on Skid Row. So if you or someone you know falls into that category, uh, we would encourage you to call Inner City Law Center's main number and our receptionist can make sure that you can get connected with one of the members of our team and then we can see if we might be able to assist. That, that's true for veterans with less than honorably discharges as well. We've got a, a fairly open-ended grant to serve veterans with bad, dis bad paper with less than honorable discharges. So if, if you know a veteran that falls into that category, um, please direct them, like Kara said, to the main line. Great. Um, so I had another question of my own, and now I can't remember what it is. <laughs> um, so I don't know what it is. So you mentioned earlier, uh, Kara, I think that uh, people can volunteer with us and, and, and lawyers can come in and get trained, and you mentioned the trainings that are available. Can you talk a little bit about what, um, you know, what pieces of what you've talked about volunteers might plug in and help out, right? You've talked about discharge issues. You've talked about the underlying be veterans uh, benefits issues. I think, John, you mentioned at one point or, or someone did that, that the issue of, you know, clearing a, a parking ticket. Like, like where, where if somebody wants to volunteer, in particular if a lawyer wants to volunteer, where might we be able to plug them in or where might they be able to be of assistance? So discharge upgrades are, are a great way for pro bono partners to get involved in our work. Um, that is, you know, we there are kind of two ways for veterans with bad paper to be able to access VA benefits. You can tackle it at the VA side of things and you can tackle it at the Department of Defense side of things as John was talking about earlier. Um, and so the discharge upgrade process is through the Department of Defense and that would actually be changing what someone's discharge paperwork says, um, which can make a, a huge difference in employment, um, you know, going for a job um, as, as someone with veteran status. Um, it can make a huge difference in someone being able to access the GI Bill, which you have to have an honorable discharge for. Um, and it can also just make a huge difference to someone feeling like their service is recognized. Um, you know, they served honorably and for reasons often beyond their control, they were given a less than honorable discharge status. So getting that actual paperwork change can be really huge for a lot of our clients. Um, so pro bono partners can get involved um, and take on one of those cases. And, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of like, 
being a detective in a lot of ways, you're kind of trawling through tons of voluminous records and looking to see, okay, what was, what was, what happened throughout this process? Was there something that was done improperly that we can point to and say, okay, you didn't, there's a process by which this person should have been discharged and it was not followed. Um, so you can challenge on the basis of impropriety and you can also challenge on the basis of inequity. Um, you know, for example, this person, um, you know, was discharged for marijuana use. Um, but what actually was the context behind that marijuana use? Was that person hazed based on, you know, their status as a black service member? Um, so you're looking at kind of like, what's the bigger picture? And then you're putting all of that evidence together and then presenting it to the boards to show them, um, you know, the reasons behind the person's you know, misconduct. Um, and a, a lot of times, you know, mental health symptoms will manifest in ways that kind of look like misconduct, which, which John was talking about earlier. Um, so there are opportunities for kind of, you know, doing that, that vast records review at doing uh, legal advocacy, writing up briefs, and then also there are opportunities for doing hearings before the boards. Um, so a variety of different ways um, that these, that, you know, these cases can look like. Right. So, um, so thank you all for for taking the time to to share with our audience, uh, you know, about, about about your experience with these cases and, and with our clients and, and the work that City Law Center does. I'm hoping, um, and I want to say thank you to our audience uh, for being with us today and joining us as well. And I want to thank uh, Aaron and Abby and Vanessa behind the scenes for making this all work smoothly. Um, but I'm hoping that maybe we can end because, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it really is our our, our stories about what our clients are struggling with and what their experience is with the VA and with us and sort of that, that trajectory that I think really illustrates the importance of this work um, and the horror and the, and the shamefulness of the fact that this is still out there. So I'm wondering if one of you has a story that maybe we could end with, um, another client story that we could, we could wrap up with. Yeah, sure, Adam. I, I'm, I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to share. I, I, I'd actually like to share a client's story um, um, that I'm really proud of. I'm really proud to have been able to work uh, with, well, we'll call her Joanne. Um, but Joanne was a trauma nurse in the Navy. Um, and while she was in the Navy, she also worked in the neonatal ICU at Walter Reed Medical Center um, out, uh, out in DC. And she loved her job. She, she really did. She loved her job in the Navy and was proud of her service. But as you can imagine, especially at this point in the presentation, her work really took a toll on her. Um, and for years after she discharged, um, she self-medicated with alcohol to attempt to control symptoms of undiagnosed PTSD and depression. Um, you know, from, from her time serving, uh, from her time as a trauma nurse, from her time in the NICU. Um, and ultimately that led to her losing her nursing license, her civilian nursing license, and eventually she became homeless. And she was living in a transitional housing facility and in treatment um, on the Westwood campus when I met her. And I, I was able to meet her through our medical legal partnership. I had a relationship with um, uh, her psychologist, actually, kind of through that clinic, um, who referred her directly to me um, for help. Um, and so after, um, after she referred her to me, I represented Joanne in her appeals, both for VA as well as her social, social security disability benefits appeal. Um, she'd applied for both of these benefits on her own initially, but she'd been denied because the original decision makers refused to acknowledge the trauma from her naval career and, and really focused only on her alcoholism and not on her diagnosed depression and PTSD when they initially evaluated her claims. Um, so again, Joanne and I got to work and after two years of working with Joanne on her cases, we won both of those appeals, both VA and social security at the hearing stage. Um, these victories were, were huge um, for a variety of the reasons we've talked about. Um, and, and one in particular, like Kara mentioned, was, was recognition. Um, the reality is we, we work with a lot of veterans who did not, for a lot of very good reasons, enjoy and in fact had some of the worst moments of their life in service. Um, Joanne's was not that case. Like I said, she, she really enjoyed um, her time in the Navy, but it was huge for her that the VA and, and Social Security to a lesser extent acknowledged um, the toll that that had taken and, and, and the, the sacrifices that she made 
doing the trauma work that she'd done for years uh, in the Navy. Um, and so that was huge for her. And, you know, obviously the, the income benefits were, 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 no small, were no small thing either. Um, and so once Joanne won um, those two cases, she had the income and the resources to move back home to New York and, and reconnect with her large family there. And this was about a couple of years ago now, but Joanne and I have stayed in, in periodic contact. She, she will check in on how I'm doing um, and give me status updates, which, which I really appreciate. And, and the last one I got from her just a couple of weeks ago, um, she sent me some photos of her house um, and of her two-year-old German Shepherd that she named Admiral or, or Addy for short, which is very much a nod to that, that Navy service that she's so proud of. Um, and while I'm proud of the work that you know I, I was able to do with Joanne, I, I really think that it's cases like hers that highlight the long-term impact of our disability benefits advocacy. Um, you know, as, as we've said today, many of the veterans that we work with have to fight hard um, for these benefits that they earned. But this ultimate success is, is life-changing. It's, you know, it's not a one-time benefit. It's, it's monthly benefits that can provide the stability that is just so important um, for the veterans that we're working with. The stability to get a house, get an apartment, um, access regular mental health care, um, and take care of a lot of those um, instabilities and, and insecurities that they had before earning, the, getting entitlement to those benefits that they earned. So that's a, a beautiful note, I think, to end on, John. Let me just say thanks again to everybody who's attending. I mean, really appreciate you learning about this work. And I know many of you are engaged with this work. And so thank you for that. Um, you know, we're not going to solve veteran homelessness or homelessness in Los Angeles unless we all get a lot more involved and do a lot more. So I appreciate you being here today. And I especially, again, want to give a shout out, shout out to Mary, John, and, and Kara, um, both for your, your presentation today, but just more generally for the work that you do and, and, and the commitment and hard work that you provide to, to our veterans and to our clients. So thank you um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everybody.